Good morning, Faith Christian Church. It's a good day to celebrate and worship. Please stand with us and let's uh, celebrate the day the Lord has made. Good morning. 
Good morning to everybody online. Good to see all of you here. Good to be worshiping uh, beside you. Good to rejoice with you. I, uh, the church that I grew up in when I was a kid, uh, it was called the First Free Will Baptist Church of Owasso. And then they made a new sign, and they put that name in smaller letters at the bottom of the sign. And then they put Rejoice up there. And they accidentally changed the name of the church because everybody started calling it Rejoice Church. A lot of churches have a big fight about, should we change the name of our church? What should we change it to? Well, they just did it accidentally, and it, it turned out really well for them. Uh, and they had a Sunday every year, I think in September sometime, that they called Rejoice Sunday, where they just sort of emphasized having joy in the Lord. And it's an interesting thing, okay? Do you think that you have control over your joy? Do you have control over that? Or are all the circumstances around you, do they dictate how you feel? Well, that's a, that's a very good thing to think about, to, to ponder. Do I really have control of my emotions, even in difficult times? Can I actually choose to rejoice? Or do I have to feel as bad as all the circumstances around me? Uh, in the Lord, you have that choice. And in the Lord, you have something to rejoice about. Don't let your circumstances dictate all of your emotions. Be hopeful. Be, uh, be at peace. Feel love towards people. And rejoice. Rejoice. All right, there you go, sermon number one. Um, there's a, we have a fellowship meal every second Sunday of the month, and that's today. And so after church, we'll be um, coming out here to the fellowship hall, and we'll be uh, eating and getting to know each other across the table. Uh, please stay. Even if you didn't bring anything, please stay. I think we'll have enough. It's, it's kind of like the loaves and fishes. We always have a, enough for everybody to have some. Uh, so please uh, plan on staying with us, uh, sitting around the table and getting to know uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ, I, and I always encourage you, uh, sit with somebody you don't know, and then just sit down and say, all right, hi, my name's such and such, uh, I, you've probably been going here for a long time, maybe I don't even remember your name, what's your name again, I'm very sorry, but, and I'll try to remember your name, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to keep, keep track of everybody's name, and then say, all right, so tell me your life story, and I'll tell you mine, okay, all right, do that, get to know each other, please, around the table, um, July 30th, the only, uh, some other things coming up this month, July 30th, is the C Rev open mic night, okay? So and it's an open mic night. It's going to be at Life Community Church, which is in town here. If you need directions, just ask me. Uh, and it's a if you say, you know what, I've always kind of wanted to be on stage. You know what, maybe I've wanted to sing. You know what, maybe I've wanted to play an instrument. You know what, maybe I've tried to, I've wanted to, but it, yes, you know, Sunday morning is, is, you know, it's. I don't think I could do that. I don't think I could go from from nothing to Sunday morning or something. So okay, so come to the open mic night and try it out, okay? See, see how, how it feels to be leading in worship or to be singing in front of other people. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great crowd. Last time, it's a, it's a great crowd. It's a very sympathetic crowd. It's, nobody's going to heckle you, I promise, okay? Um, but come be part of that. Our worship team is going to uh, play some songs for it, and um, there will be some other churches there uh, represented, too. It'll be a great time. Um, August 13th. August 3rd, well, August 6th, let me come back to that first. August 6th is a Saturday, and we have a blood drive here. So make sure that uh, it's a Red Cross blood drive. Uh, how many of you have given blood in our Red Cross blood drive before? Yeah? Oh, really? Okay, all right. All right. Uh, um, anyway, sign up for that. Slots go fast whenever, whenever it, it comes around. August 13th is our lobster picnic and baptism. Uh, we ba basically baptize people once a year. I can baptize anybody any Sunday by just pouring water over their head, okay? But if you want to be uh, properly dunked in a bo natural body of water, all right, we don't do that often in January, uh, but we do it in August, and August 13th is when it is this year. It's out in Jefferson at the Del Gallo's camp. It's on Little Dyer Pond. Um, if you've never been baptized, let me know. Let's talk about it, and I'll tell you about the meaning of baptism I'll ask you a few questions, and then we'll get you baptized, okay? All right. Um, the only other thing is the cookbook, okay? We've got a big project going here, uh, the cookbook. Is there anything that I forgot to say there, Dixie?
Okay, so. Okay, okay. So August first is your deadline to get uh, to get uh, recipes in. And actually today, after church, we can fire up the computer in the office there. And if you don't have a computer or if you just want to say, hey, you know what, I'll get it done today, we can, we can have it fired up, ready to go, and we can put your recipes in today during fellowship meal. Okay? All right. I don't think there are any other announcements, uh, so let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get back into to worship. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the joy that we can have in you. We thank you, Lord, that we can... Uh, we can rise above our circumstances. You have transcended all things. We can certainly rise above. You can give us joy amidst difficulty. You give us hope and peace. Lord, help us to make the decision to rejoice in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand and keep worshiping.
Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you,
Good morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy and grace, for your compassion on us. May we be faithful and loving in return. Father, be with those who are needing your healing balm. 
Grant them peace in the trials they face, not alone as it seems to them, but with you as their guide and comforter. Bring relief to them, and may you be glorified. Father, help us understand your ways in this unsettled world. Bring us into your will so we can be your servant, providing for, helping others, loving our neighbors, all the ones we like, and the ones, the ones that cause us to dislike them. May our actions be a result of your love and result in you being glorified. Be with this body today. Open the hearts and eyes of each to receive your message, unique and loving for each. May the words shared spur one another to deeper love and action. Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. In the Pew Bible in front of you, that's page 403. Page 403. While you're turning there, I'll just express my appreciation for um, all of the people who are part of um, making our Sunday morning worship service. Um, I, uh, I And I appreciate the, the congregational prayer givers. Okay, uh, We have some people that... Absolutely, they love to do it. And other people that's like, okay, okay, I can do it. Okay, whew, I can do it. And other people that really have to overcome a lot of anxiety to get up here and get a microphone and, and actually give that prayer. Uh, so not everybody you see up here doing something is, is just extremely comfortable with it. Uh, but I appreciate everybody who does it, and especially those who have to uh, overcome something to do it. I, I really appreciate them uh, doing what they do. Uh, and, and I send out a list. So we, we planned this, you know, I, I, we're... we're the third quarter is planned out till the end of September. You can almost always know when a new quarter has started because Dale Morrill is almost always the first one on the list. And the reason he's the first one on the list is because I know he doesn't mind, or at least he doesn't complain, about being put on short notice. And I send that lo list out generally Friday afternoon, the day before, or, you know, the Sunday before, or the, the Friday before. Uh, it was going to be critical uh, to, to get it done. So anyway, I appreciate that, Dale. Uh, but I appreciate everybody who's involved in... Um, and, and I hate to use the word production because we don't put on a production. We worship, right? But to have an organized worship service, it takes a lot of people uh, to be involved. It takes people on the stage. It takes people in the booth back there. It takes people in the offices getting things done. Uh, so not everybody just up here on stage is, is, is part of that. There are a lot of people that are, that are part of that. Uh, and it's not just people who sing, or it's not just people who operate the technology and all of that. It's the, the people who pray and the people who um, organize things and write things and all that. And then, there, of course, there are the people who, uh, who aren't hearing this right now but they're, because they're back in Sunday school. But I appreciate everybody, um, you know, to think about how many people, how many people are involved in Sunday morning worship. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably about double what, what you could count. It's probably about double that. So anyway, if you know somebody who's involved in what we do here on Sunday morning to, to make this worship service ha happen, uh, make sure that, you, that they hear your, uh, your appreciation uh, for that. And I certainly appreciate it. I couldn't do it alone. All right, so let's talk about um, David today. All right, so we're, we're going through a, a sermon series called Encounters. And uh, the idea is that there are these individuals in the Bible who had incredible encounters with God. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is that sort of in each generation, and it's not even in each generation, maybe at this point in the, in the Old Testament stories, it's each generation has this person that steps forward, that receives this great encounter with the Lord, and they lead the people. But there are actually generations of people, or, or generations in, the, in the, the story of the Old Testament where people really didn't hear very much. Okay? They, it, it didn't seem like anybody was having a burning bush moment. Uh, but you have people like Abraham, who 
definitely heard the voice of the Lord and definitely uh, knew who God was and knew what God required of him. And it was a daunting task and he did it. And then you have uh, people like Moses and we saw him last week. And he, uh, in the Old Testament, it would be hard to argue who had the greatest, the greatest face-to-face encounter with God. Uh, to me, there, there are two people who had the greatest encounters with God. Uh, it would be Moses at the burning bush, but then Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. And I don't know if I'm going to preach Isaiah or not. Uh, I think maybe he'll either be next week or I'll skip him. I don't know. But Isaiah chapter 6 is po- possibly the most, one of the most glorious passages in the Old Testament because it's just about a man who was a priest who goes into a temple every day and there's a table over here a golden table and a golden lampstand over here and there's a room back there that we only go in once a year and every day you just come in and you do your duties and then one day then one day he walked into there and there was God not symbolically not a painting not a statue certainly not a statue it was him oh oh my goodness It's a very different experience than what he had every other day going into the temple to do his duties. So anyway, I may I may preach about him next week or not. You you pray and let and help help the Lord uh, tell the Lord to let me decide. Do you want do you want to hear that that story or not? Uh, And I will say this: this is like the best and worst sermon I've ever heard. We're on Isaiah chapter six. Okay, Uh, there was a guy that I heard in a revival preaching that, and it was unbelievable. And then there was another guy who came to chapel when I was in college and preached it, and it was like, dude, what are you even talking about here? It was he was it was it was just it was just rambling stories, kind of like what I do. And today we're going to get somebody uh, who also had. As I was researching David, I, I mean, I just, I just said, okay, David, you got to put David in there. This is when I was planning out the sermon series. And then I went through and everything, and, and I said, you know what? David didn't really have a burning bush moment. He didn't have an Isaiah mo- moment. David didn't have an Abraham moment. You know, I think I can say this. I, I think I've done my research to say this. Every time David heard from the Lord, it was through a prophet. It was through somebody else. It wasn't that David was walking around someday and then, bam, there was God right in front of him giving him a, a, a message and, or anything. David seems to have always heard through the prophet. And I thought, well, I don't know. Maybe I should leave him in the series or maybe I should not leave him in the series. I don't know. Except I think I should leave him in the series, and I did. That's what we're preaching today. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because we have something in common with David. I've never had a burning bush moment, Okay. I've never been out somewhere and there was a bush that didn't that was on fire but wasn't consumed by the flames and obvious and then all of a sudden the voice of the Lord started speaking to me through it. Never had that experience. I'd love to have that experience, I think. But I've never had that experience. And I've never had the, the experience like Isaiah, where I just walked in the sanctuary one day and boom, there was God, the throne room of God. No? Never had that experience either. Um Much of the time, when the Lord has really spoken to me, most of the time, except for a few times in prayer maybe, most of the time when I felt like the Lord was speaking to me most, it was through the prophet. Now who is the prophet? What am I talking about through the prophet? I'm actually talking about the Bible. The Bible. Because who are the prophets? Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel. David himself is sort of like a prophet. Moses, like a prophet. And then in the New Testament, we call them apostles, but they were people who heard from God and then wrote it down. We hear through the Bible. And who wrote the Bible? The people who had the gift of prophecy. They wrote the word, uh, they heard the word from God and wrote it down. So we got it through them. And in that way, We have a lot in common with David. We have our heritage, we have our faith, we have our doctrines, we're following the Lord. But most of the time, we really need to hear from the Lord through the prophet. The the most reliable prophet, which is the Word of God. So let me tell you a little bit about David. And to do this, we sort of have to give a little bit of backstory, uh, and I hope the backstory doesn't go too long, but uh, David wasn't born into... No context. He was born into a, a context. He emerges on the Bible story, in the Bible story, uh, 
in, in a context. So let me hear, let me tell you what that was. Israel has been established as a nation. They were taken out of Egypt as slaves. Uh, Moses, and, uh, Moses led them in the wilderness all those years, gave them the law, gave them their culture, gave them their heritage, gave them the doctrines of the Lord, uh, formed them as a people, and then he uh, um, died on the top of Mount Nebo, and Joshua took the people into the promised land, and they drove out the Canaanites, and they established a nation. And after they established a nation, it's a very interesting thing that they didn't have a constitutional convention and decide the three branches of government and have elections or anything like that. They didn't do that. They s settled into their land. Joshua divided up the allotment of who gets what land, and now everybody make a life for yourself. But there really wasn't a political structure. If there was, it was a very weak political structure. Uh, it was basically the elders of your clan, your tribe. They were the, the highest authorities in your life. And uh, then there was the priesthood that was out there. They were an authority in your life. Um, but e even, I think we see in the book of Joshua and certainly in Judges and at the beginning of Samuel, the nation of Israel did not have this strong identity of we are Israelites, okay? Now, they were Israelites, and they knew they were Israelites. They knew they were children of Abraham, children of, of uh, Isaac and Jacob, Israel, and uh, they knew who they were that way. But I also think that you could almost think of them as a loose confederation of tribes because they went to war with each other. They weren't exactly united with each other. They were kind of a loose confederation of these family clans together. And every once in a while when they had trouble, God would raise up an individual that they called a judge. Really, he was a judge that because he made decisions for people and there was one female judge too, but they were also largely warrior judges, warrior generals who would... Uh, call the army forward, let's go and let's take care of this problem. Uh, and then after that, I will judge and I will be the judge and I'll, and I'll take care of all of your disputes as well. But almost always they, they rose up uh, to fight an external enemy. And then after that, they arbitrated internal uh, strife as well. And they had judges when they needed them. It wasn't like a hereditary title, and it wasn't like an election or anything like that. God would raise somebody up. That person would lead the, the nation as a whole for a while, for, for the rest of his life, and then after that he died, and then we're back to sort of a power vacuum in the country. And the elder of my tribe and the Levites, the, the, priest, uh, the priestly family, the priestly class, they are sort of the, uh, the, the authorities in the land. And then arises the, the judge and the prophet Samuel. So Samuel was this guy who was the last judge, people would say. Uh, he was this very powerful sort of prophet. He was not a king, uh, but he was definitely a priest before the Lord, and he's a very unique individual. We have a lot written about his life uh, from birth to death. And during his lifetime, the people said, basically, we're tired of the system we've got. This loose confederation or... Um, these judges that sort of pop up from time to time. Uh, our elders are our authority. The priests are an authority. We're really kind of tired of that system. We want a king. We want a king so that there will always be somebody on the throne. So that we will always have a leader. And Samuel got upset with them. And I think he got upset maybe for some wrong reasons because uh, he felt rejected. Like, I'm not good enough and my, my sons after me who are going to be priests, they're not good enough for you. Huh? And so he went to the Lord to talk about it, and the Lord said, why are you so upset? It's me they've rejected. They don't want to live under my leadership. They don't want me to be their king. Uh, all this time that they think that there's a power vacuum, all this time that they think that there's no king, that there's nobody sitting on the throne, that nobody's directing anything, that's an insult to me because I'm sitting on the throne. I'm directing all of these things. They want somebody instead of me. And so Samuel and the Lord hash it out for a little bit, and finally the Lord says, they want a king, give them a king. I want you to give them a king. And so the Lord gives them a king. And uh, the story of this king, and his name is not David, his name is Saul, S-A-U-L, Saul, King Saul. And the story of King Saul is an incredible tragedy because he started off so good. He started off so good, so powerful. And, uh, but he wasn't a man after God's heart. All right, and that, that phrase becomes very important, and we ap apply that, that phrase always to David. He was a man who sought after God's own heart. But Saul was not that man. Saul was typical, is what I'd say. He was typical. He was a typical warrior king of that day. 
do you know the great criteria? Of course, the Lord chose him, but do you know the great criteria that he met, that, he, uh, that made him king and made everybody want to follow him? Do you know what it was? He was tall. He was tall. And you can laugh about that all you want, but did you know in our presidential elections for the last hundred years or so, did you know that we have always elected the taller candidate? All right. So are we better? We often laugh at the people in the Bible sometimes because of the silly things that they do. We do silly things too. Saul was tall. He was tall, dark, and handsome. He was strong. In fact, he wasn't just tall. He was a head and shoulders above everybody else. He was a big man. There's a a police officer in our town here named Sam Quintana. Anybody know who Sam Quintana is? He's a great guy. He's a gentle giant. But let me tell you, folks, he's a giant. Okay? Uh, I I saw him on uh, Friday night, and when I first came up to him, he was sitting on a big rock. And this is at the Waterfront concert. And he was sitting there talking, and we were talking and everything. He was sitting down. And then at a certain point, he stood up, and it's like, this conversation just got really uncomfortable. Okay? (laughs) Yeah. Because he is that tall. Uh, he's got to be six foot eight or six foot seven, something like that. He's huge. And he's all smiles, too. That's the, that's, the, that's the great thing about him. Saul was tall. Hmm. Is that a great basis to choose a king? But the Lord chose him. The Lord chose him. Let's not, just, let's not just say that the people chose a bad king. The Lord chose him. And Samuel went and anointed him. But after that, there was actually great promise. Because the Spirit of the Lord filled Saul. And the day that Samuel anointed him, while he was walking home, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him when he met up with some other prophets, and he began to prophesy with them. And what does it mean to prophesy? You're speaking out the words and praise of God. You're saying things, that the the eternal truth of God. That sounds good. A tall, dark, strong, handsome man filled with the Spirit of God speaking his truth. How could you go wrong? How could you go wrong? But over time, we began to see that Saul was not after God's own heart. I've talked about this before. I think we all kind of understand this. But you have, as a believer, as a, as a Christ follower, you have two, two relationship axes that you need to be, pay attention to. Because the great commandment is, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have a vertical relationship, and you have a horizontal relationship. Okay? And you are supposed to take great care with both of those relationships. That you are cultivating a relationship with Jesus Christ. With God Almighty seated on the throne. That you know Him. He knows you. You are doing His words and speaking His words and doing His works. You are passionately chasing His heart. What does He think is right and good? And you're doing that. And then you're supposed to be loving people, loving people. Out of the outpouring of that relationship, you're supposed to be loving people with that same kind of love. But Saul didn't do that. Saul didn't prioritize the vertical relationship. Instead, this is what his relationships looked like. It's not that I'm pouring out love to all these people. I'm trying to please them so that they like me. Okay? And then after that, I acknowledge God sometimes. Okay? And that's the wrong way to do business. Okay? It's the wrong way to live life, and it's the wrong way to lead a nation. And eventually what happened, and it sounds like a small thing. It sounds like a small thing. It, it often sounds like, well, David did much worse. I mean, he was an adulterer or a murderer, right? And we all know that. Or if you've read the story of his life, you know that. So why in the world is he so good and Saul is so bad? Because let me tell you what Saul did. This is the thing... Uh, this is the two things that really, that really um, uh, caused his, the break in his relationship with the Lord. The first thing he did was Samuel was late to the battle. They got to go to battle. Uh, war is upon them. And before you go to battle, you better worship and make sacrifice to the Lord to ensure that you'll have victory in battle. And Samuel was late to coming to the battle. So Saul said, okay, just give it to me and I'll do it. Does that sound so bad? I mean, Samuel was late, right? This has to be done. And if Samuel's not going to be here, somebody's got to do it. So I'll do it, right? Wrong. Wrong. There are are ways we dare not overstep our bounds, all right? God established the the priestly class in, in Israel, the Levites. 
They are the ones to do it. And it's not just Levites. It's the descendants of Aaron among the tribe of the Levites. They are the ones that are supposed to do this. Nobody else gets to do this. Just them. And Saul said, just whatever. It doesn't matter who does it. Just bring it to me and I'll do it. He was far too casual with the things of God. Far too casual. So he showed there was some dishonor there. And then the next thing he did, this is going to sound even stranger. He didn't commit the genocide he was supposed to. Right? Right? God gave him a command. You're going to battle. I want you to go to battle. And when you go to battle, you don't get to keep anything. You don't get get to keep the spoils of war after this one. You have to wipe out these people. And you don't get to keep the spoils of war for yourself. And so what did he do? He went to battle. And he killed off everybody that was worthless to him. But he kept the king. Well, the king is probably the problem in that other tribe anyway, or in that other group anyway. But I'll keep him. He'll be my friend. I'll keep him. He'll be like a part of my menagerie. I'll put him on display. Look at what I did. I got him. I captured him alive. Look at this. I'll keep him. And all of that cattle and all of the spoils and everything, I'll distribute it to my men so that it's profitable for them to go to war. And God said, no, 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 no. All of that, all of those lives of people and animals and everything, that was for me. I gave you a command, and you didn't do it. You kept back for yourself what was meant to be given over to God. And in that way, he also showed he didn't believe in, he didn't didn't love God, he didn't prioritize God, he didn't uh, submit to God, he didn't give to God everything that's supposed to be given to God, and instead, he's trying to please the people around him. And at that point, the Lord says, I'm done with him. I'm done with him because he's not after my heart. I want a king, a man to lead my people who is seeking after my heart and not their own popularity and their own glory. And there is a place in here where Samuel was looking for Saul and they said, he's over there uh, erecting a monument to himself. Oh, okay. That's the kind of man he became. And so, at the very end, interestingly, the very end of 1 Samuel chapter 15, just you're there in your Bible, just look up a verse. This is after God has rejected Saul. He says, uh, he's, not my, he's not my man anymore. Look at verse 35. Until the, sa- the day Samuel died, because at a certain point, Samuel confronted Saul and said, that's it. The Lord is done with you. And after that, it, it's, he confronted Saul, and still, this is what Saul said, but will you please come with me to the big gathering so that everybody still thinks that you're endorsing me? He's still just looking to please these people and have his own glory. And then Samuel said, yeah, all right, I'll do it. Blah, 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 blah. But in, after that day, until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. Though Samuel mourned for him. Oh, and I think that that's a great That's a great phrase in there that it's not, I don't think God was flippant about Saul and his life and his soul, and I don't think Samuel was either. And I don't know, have you ever discipled somebody or poured into somebody and then you see them go the wrong way? I've been teaching you, I've been pouring into you, I've been sharing Jesus with you, I've been doing everything I can for you, and now I see you go the wrong way? What do you do for that person? You mourn for that person. You mourn. He mourned for him. Saul's not even dead, and he's still mourning for him. And the Lord regretted. Some of your Bibles might say God repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Can God repent? What? I thought repenting is something you do after you've sinned. After you've sinned, after you've done some kind of evil, you repent and you, 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 you don't live that way anymore. How, do you, how can God repent? How can God even regret? Doesn't he know everything that's going to happen? Doesn't he know? Okay. There's a, there's a nice little mystery, a nice little a place in the Bible where, um, where we're, we relate to God. How about this? We and God feel the same emotions a lot of times. Maybe over for, the, for different reasons, but we feel the same emotions. God is not a stoic uh, deity far away who never really feels anything. No, he feels deep pain and joy. But what can it mean that God repented or that God regretted or that God was doing something different? Well, this is what it is. God made Saul king, and now he's, when it says he's repenting or saying, saying that he's repenting, what it means is, I'm, I'm doing a 180. 
That's because that's what part of what repenting is. I'm living this way, uh, and then when I repent, I start to learn this or live this way. I, I, I do a 180, and I start going the other direction. And so what we have here is that God made Saul king, and now he's going to unmake Saul king. He's going to uncrown him. He crowned him, and now he's going to uncrown him. And that is what that is where we begin with the life of David. Let's go. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? It looks like the Lord got over it before Samuel did. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he'll kill me. If I, if I crown somebody else king, he's going to kill me for that, right? The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. So when you get there, say, come say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. That's perfectly reasonable. He does that kind of thing all the time, all right? Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint uh, for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? That's interesting. <laughs> they didn't assume it was good when the prophet came. <laughs> all right, that's, that's funny to me anyway. Yes, in peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them uh, to the sacrifice. How do you consecrate yourself? I, a lot of it is take a bath and put on your best clothes and abstain from uh, sexual relations and, and just kind of make yourself holy to the Lord for special purpose, not a common day anymore. Put on your best clothes. We're going we're gonna to have a worship service. Okay. Samuel replied, uh, no, verse 6. When they arrived, everybody's been consecrated and everybody's dressed up and everybody's uh, done their ceremonial washings and all that. Samuel saw Eliab, and that he's the oldest son, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. So it's a very interesting thing that even here, even after we've supposedly learned our lesson with Saul, even the prophet Samuel looks around and says, look at this tall, dark, handsome guy. Suddenly, head, head and shoulders above everybody else. Look at those biceps. This has got to be the guy right here, right? Even Samuel gets fooled by the outward appearances of the handsome, strong, charismatic man. That's interesting. All right, let's keep going. If I can find my place again. Verse 8. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven sons of his pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. And I, 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 put, the, I put a confusing tone in there. The Lord has not chosen these. He told me to come here and choose one of your sons. The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Oh, well, no, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. He's the pipsqueak. He's the lowest, on the lowest rung on the ladder. He's the one we give all the grunt work to. He's the one that hasn't grown up yet. He's the one that's shorter than all the rest. He's out there tending the sheep because I assumed it couldn't possibly be him. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Uh, some of your Bibles will say he was ruddy. He was ruddy. How many of your Bibles say R-U-D-D-Y, ruddy? That's not a word we use very often, but he was ruddy. And what does it mean? What does it mean? Uh, it means that, he, I think it, partly it means he was sunburned. <laughs> Uh, partly it means he was he was dark okay uh, and, and and let me talk about that just a little bit um do you tan do you go out and get a tan only in the last hundred years i would say have people sought a tan because only in the last hundred years has that been considered attractive almost always in all of world history Fairer skin is better. And do you know why? Because slaves and field hands are dark. Slaves and field hands are dark. People of low status, people who do manual labor out there in the sun, 
they are dark-skinned. Everybody from the upper classes, everybody who is wealthy, everybody who is comfortable in life, they stay inside during the heat of the day. And their skin is nicer. Their skin is whiter. They are nice and creamy, right? In the Song of Solomon, uh, he talks about the beauty of this girl. But she says, I'm not pretty. I'm dark-skinned. And a lot of people thought she was black, like she was a black African girl, but that, that was not it. She's Jewish, okay? What it was was she said, my brothers made me go out and work in the fields. I'm not pretty. I look like a slave or a field hand. I look like a manual laborer. My hands are, my hands are rough. Do you remember in Gone with the Wind? Do you remember that? Uh, what did she say? A mother said a, a lady, uh, you could always tell a lady by her hands. And after the war, when they were desperate, Scarlett had to do manual labor for the first time in her life. And her hands were calloused and dirty. And she tried to wear gloves to hide those, something like that. She was ashamed that her hands were not soft and pretty. And the girl in the Song of Solomon, I'm not pretty. My hands are dirty, my hands are calloused, and I'm dark-skinned. Look at Dave. And Dave, David's brothers, the oldest one, uh, he's put in his dues. He works inside the tent now. He does accounting. He's got a desk job, right? So he's not so, he's not so weathered out there. He's not so rough-skinned. He's not so dark. He's not sunburned. But David is. It says he, has, he was ruddy and he had beautiful eyes. I, I picture him with a, just a compelling face. Have you ever met somebody who their face just is, has got this maybe ferocity about it, you know, the, with a dark brow and deep set eyes, and then he's got this uh, tanned, leathery skin like that, and he comes in and he's just got this compelling face. This compelling face. He's a compelling man. He's a very emotional man, too. He was out in the fields taking care of those sheep all the time in sandstorms, in, in sun, in rain, occasionally in, in the desert. And while he was out there, he had to face wild animals. And uh, he had, what did he have for a weapon? What was his weapon? Do you remember? The sling, the sling. I don't know if you know, but in, earlier in the book of, of 1 Samuel, it talks about what a disadvantage the Israelites had against the Philistines especially, because the Philistines are Bronze Age people. Bronze swords, metal swords, metal spear tips on their, on their, and metal shields. They've got metal of everything. And the Israelites have wood and stone. They're Paleolithic against these Neolithic people out there. These people that are Bronze Age, they're so strong. And even David, what's he got? A string with a rock in it. That's his weapon. That's all he's got. Yet he has slain a lion and a bear. He's even done hand-to-hand -hand combat with some of these wild animals out there and won. That's how tough David has gotten out there. Ah, he's not the tallest, but he's the toughest. And his face, I think, is the most compelling. And when he comes and stands before Samuel, look at there, at, at the second half of verse 12. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, right in front of all of them. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David, and Samuel then went home to Ramah. And David becomes the great king. He's the warrior king. He's the tough man. What's the next thing that happens in, in David's life? The thing you know best of all, his battle with Goliath. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him, giving him courage. He's tough as leather. He's tough as a boot. He's not afraid of anything because he's done hand-to-hand -hand combat, even with wild animals. And the giant comes out. The giant comes out. If you don't know the story of David and Goliath, here it is in a nutshell. Uh, two neighboring nations at war with each other, and they're at a stalemate uh, uh, on either side of a valley. The Israelites are on this side, the Philistines are on this side, and in the middle, there's the battleground, but nobody's rushing into battle. The, maybe, I, I don't know why the Philistines aren't so confident that they don't want to just rush into battle. Maybe they're just, they're just timid for some reason. 
The Israelites are certainly timid because they've got uh, previous war technology here with just wood and, and stone. And so they're at a stalemate, and they're there for a long time. And so then one of the Philistines has an idea. Hey, let's just do a one-man, a one-to-one combat thing. We don't have to all go to war with each other. Send our champion against their champion, and we'll let them decide who the real winner of the battle is. And, and so this is what happens. They send out Goliath. And Goliath says, and how big is Goliath? He's big. He's bigger than Saul. He's bigger than Eliab. He's bigger than anybody else out there because he's nine feet tall. He's nine feet tall. He's probably inbred, by the way, because in the Chronicle or the Kings or Chronicles later on, it talks about him having six, hand, six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. He's got more than one problem. He's got a giant, giantism thing in his pituitary. There he is, huge guy. And he comes out and he taunts the God of Israel. He taunts Israel by taunting their God. If anybody ever wants to taunt you, what do they taunt? Do they taunt you? No, they taunt somebody you love. Your mother, your mother wears army boots. Your God wears army boots, blah, blah, blah. I don't know that that's very much of an insult. Uh, God is quite, a, quite the commander of the army. But he comes out and he taunts Israel's God. And nobody else, not Saul, nobody else in his army says, Well, I ain't standing for that. Only when David comes to see his brothers and how they're doing in the battle, because David's not in the army, and he hears Goliath taunting God, and he says, are you men or mice? Are you going to let him get away with that? All of you soldiers, pansies you are. I'll take the giant. And he goes and he says, Saul, I'm not going to stand for it. I'll let him, I'll, I'll go face him. And Saul says, okay, if you want to, take my armor. And David tries it on and says, no, it doesn't fit. I don't need it. I'll go get some stones from the river. And how many stones did he get? Five. He got five smooth stones. Do you know why? Because Goliath had brothers. And he thought he might have to take them all. So he goes out there, and, giant, and, and the giant looks at this little kid, ruddy, fresh-faced kid with no armor, and says, This is an insult. I told you to send your champion. And David says, look, you think you're the champion, but I come to you in the name of the living God. Let's do battle. And we all know what happened. And by the way, those sling stones are about that big. It's not a little, it's not, it's not a skipping rock, okay? It's a rock about this big. And he puts it in this thing and 200, 300, 300 feet per second. Boom. I don't care what kind of helmet you got on sinks deep into the giant's forehead, and the giant falls. And just for good measure, David's going to go pick up a sword. Never held a sword in his life. It's a Bronze Age weapon. He doesn't have that kind of stuff. Picks it up. It's a heavy sword, by the way, for this giant. <coughs> off with his head. His most noble part. And I just cut it off. This is you, Philistines. This is what I think of you and you taunting my God. Go get them, boys. And the battle rages. Wow! The man after God's own heart will not stand for God to be insulted. And he goes after the giant, slays the giant, and it's victory for the people of Israel. And after that, everything changes in Israel. Because the people stop singing Saul's song. They start singing David's song. Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. He just killed one. But that's 10,000 right there. That's 10,000 points in the game. All right. That's David. That's his first encounter with God through the prophet, where the prophet says, you're God's man because you're after his heart. Be anointed. Let the Spirit of God fall on you, fill you up. And in the next chapter, we see what a man after God's heart, filled with God's Spirit, will do. All right. So let's talk about us. Don't always expect a burning bush encounter. Where are you going to hear from the Lord most 
of the time and most reliably. It's right here. If you complain and complain and complain, the Lord's just not talking to me. The Lord's just not talking to me. The Lord's just not talking to me. Make sure that every time you open this book, your view changes that, God, you are talking to me. What did Samuel say? Speak, Lord, your servant hears. That might be a good prayer to pray every time you open your Bible to read it. Speak, Lord, your servant hears, and then start reading. And then assume that there is a message for you in there. You may have to dig for it. You may have to think about it for a long time. But you need to be hearing from God himself. You need to hear God's word. This is God's word. You need to be hearing from it. You may not have a burning bush encounter, but the word of the Lord does come to you. Expect to hear from God. Seek to follow God. Don't follow a person. Don't follow a political leader. Don't even follow clergy or not even some hero that, that's, that's done so much. Seek to follow God. Don't follow people. We follow people so much. We, we look at them and say, now that's what I want to be like. That, that person's really smart. Boy, that person's really got talent. That person really says some compelling things. Seek to follow the Lord. He is the compelling one. He is the powerful one. He is the wise one. Look at your life and say, Lord, is there somebody I'm following closer than I'm following you? And then you may want to change that. Number three, prioritize the vertical over the horizontal. Okay? Don't seek approval from the horizontal. Seek approval from the vertical. And then let that flow out to the horizontal. Uh, I, I heard a pastor one time say, some people are wonderful, but they make terrible gods. Don't seek your approval from them. Seek your approval from God and let, it, let his approval pour down into your life and then pour that out in love to other people, what you are giving to other people. Do not seek approval or blessing or whatever from other people. Seek that from God. Prioritize the vertical, and that will actually improve the horizontal. If you prioritize the horizontal, it'll make you afraid like Saul was afraid. You never fear of losing God, do you? Do you ever? I don't know. I don't, I don't think most people do. You may, have, you may fear approve, uh, losing the approval of other people, and you may lose the approval of other people. People are fickle. Maybe they were right. Maybe they were wrong to shut you out of their life. I don't know. But God is pouring into you. God has a connection with you that cannot be broken. He is not fickle. He is not capricious. Seek your approval from him. Seek your identity from him, not from other people. If you do, you'll be able to bless those. But if you seek all of your approval from, from the horizontal, from other people, it'll ruin your relationship with the vertical. Get those straight. There is a first commandment and a second commandment. Okay? First commandment, second commandment. Don't neglect either. If you neglect either, you have lost the essence of Christianity. But do prioritize this one over that one. Okay? Get your joy, your hope, your peace, your love from this one and then let that pour out in this one. Don't seek it from this one. Everybody else, if you seek your approval or your hope or joy or whatever from me, I'm sorry, I am a shallow well, okay? You can't get much of it from me. You can get all you want from God. You can pour over, you know, your cup runneth over when it's from God. When it's from Wes, it's as small as the communion cup. Half the communion cup. That's what you get from me. Get everything you can from God, okay? Okay. Today at the end of our service, I want to do something. Something a little different. Something we don't normally do. I want to anoint you. If you're a Christ follower, I want to anoint you today. And not because you're not already anointed. Okay? What does that even mean to anoint? We talked about it here. Samuel anointed David. In the Old Testament, or in the whole Bible, you'll see people anointed for three different reasons. Uh, one of them sometimes is 
part of that consecrating that they were doing, they would anoint or they, and, and a lot of times that's just kind of like putting on some smell good, all right? Putting on, putting a little slickum in your hair and a little perfume on your body. You've anointed yourself. Um, and it's kind of like, you remember when the woman came and poured the oil over, over the, uh, the, the perfume over Jesus? She anointed him with it, okay? Now, she was doing that for holy purposes. She had that stuff for herself for, you know, common purposes, just for every day, for those special days when you dress up and you want to look good and smell good. That's kind of one common way that you'll see people uh, use the word anoint in the Bible. The other way, another way, is medicinal. Medicinal. They didn't have a lot of uh, medicine, but they'll talk about balm and oil and things like that. If you've got a wound in the Bible, uh, you need to clean it out, and then you need to anoint it with some oil, and that'll keep the infections out. Okay? Balm. Is there balm in Gilead? That's a, that's a question the prophet raised. Okay? So you anoint with those things for medicinal purposes. But the, the other way, and this is the way that we're using it here, is that you anoint holy things. You anoint holy things. So like in the um, Old Testament, when they made the tabernacle, the articles of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, that golden table, the golden lampstand, uh, Moses went around and he anointed it all. Sprinkled some oil, and he actually did oil and blood on them to anoint them, to make them not common usage. This table here is not for common use, you got tables all over your house. You throw books and car keys. You got, if you've got a surface, it's got stuff on it in your house, right? But this table is different. It is for holy purposes. We don't use it for common things. We use it for worship and holy purposes. It's anointed. This lampstand over here, there's lampstands all over, but not this lampstand. It gets a special oil, and it's for a special purpose. It's holy. It's not common. The Ark of the Covenant, of course, it was unique. It was certainly holy. We see new priests get anointed to make them holy. And we see kings here get anointed. You're set apart. You're not a common man anymore, David. You're the king. Your purposes now are God's purposes. Your influence, greater than it ever has been. Your respect for the things of the Lord just needs to kick up a notch. You're holy now. You've been anointed. Do you know uh, there's this, this word in the Old Testament that means the anointed one? Do you know what it is? Messiah. Messiah. Jesus is the anointed one. Even among holy things, Jesus is, capital M, the anointed one, Messiah. Unlike any man that ever was, he is the Messiah. You, as his follower, are anointed. You're not, a, you're not a common person. You believe in Jesus. You're following Jesus. You're not a common person anymore. You're set apart. You're holy. And God has certain words for you to speak and certain works for you to do. That old life, that common life, it's gone. The holy life has come. And so what are we going to do? If you're not comfortable with this, don't feel pressured to, to, to come forward or to join or anything. But I'm gonna, I've got a few people, and they're going to come up here. And this is what's going to happen. They're gonna come, you're going to come to them, and you're, they're going to ask you, have you confessed your faith in Jesus as Savior? And that word confess there, I don't mean like I've done something wrong, I need to confess. It means I've declared it. I've said it out loud. I confess it before everybody. I declare before everybody, yes, I believe in Jesus as my Savior. They will, and, and if you say yes, then they will say then I'm going to anoint you. And they go, I've got a, little, uh, got a little thing right here. It's just got olive oil in it, okay? It's not, it's not magic potion. They're going to dip their finger in that, and they're going to say, well, then I anoint you. Know for certain that God's Spirit dwells in you, and I anoint you as his son or as his daughter for the authority, with authority to bring honor to his name because you're supposed to be a person after his own heart by speaking his words and performing his deeds. And after that, you can say, amen. And they'll, they'll put a little bit, a little cross right here on your forehead. And if you want to, hold out your hands and they'll put a little dot right in the palms of your hands too for the deeds that you do. Okay? Does that make sense? Chris is going to play guitar just to, to have background music. We're going to turn off the live stream in a moment. But come forward. One of those elders, one of those people will anoint you 
Not because you're not already anointed. If you're a Christ follower, you've got his spirit in you. He has anointed you. He has set you apart as holy to do his great works and speak his great words. But just as a reminder, just a physical thing to give you a spiritual reminder of who you are in Christ, we're going to do this today. And then after that, I want you to go out and slay giants. Okay? Metaphorically. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the anointing, the anointing of your spirit, the anointing of the spiritual oil that you give us. We thank you for setting us apart, Lord, for good works and to speak good words, to speak good news. Help us, Lord, to live as your sons and daughters. Help us, Lord, to bless the world by doing your works of love and speaking your true words. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So.